And welcome everybody. It's Monday Q and A, the business of wine, January 2018. So, um, uh, as you can see, my environment has changed, and I'm in beautiful uh, Portland near the conference center for the Oregon Wine Symposium, and I'll be speaking tomorrow. And um, uh, we're launching a, a project with the um, Oregon Wine Board for the Wine Biz Sim. Uh, we made a, a cost of goods calculator as part of our overhaul of all the, the books. The next class is going to get uh, possibly a, a whole new look, look at things. Um, and so we're on a field trip to Portland, Oregon. I was just sharing the, the trials and tribulations of getting in and out of Bend, Oregon. And you have to go up over the Cascades, and it was about 17 miles an hour for about 40 miles through heavy snow and ice. But um, I made it. <clears throat> Only to be forestalled by the rotten traffic in Portland. None. I, I, I was actually worried about, but I, I was coming up from the south on five. Yeah. And um, boom, right here. And slid into a parking spot, ran up, got on the internet, and here we are. You got into city center today with, well, it's President's Day. Yes, that's true. Normally, in and around city center, it's gridlocked from 7 in the morning till 10, and from 3 until 7. Yep. Gridlock. Okay, so um, what should we do, you guys? I've got a couple of things kind of queued up uh, in terms of just – you know, where we are in marketing and so forth. And one of the things I thought that I could do is uh, share a bit about the, the, the wine symposium. And, and it really brings forward marketing organizations. You know, the, the marketing of wine goes so, so far beyond just marketing the wine. Um, when I was checking in, somebody was talking with the person at registration about attending the Tempranillo celebration that they have down in Medford's in Southern Oregon every year. And it's, it's the growers from that area who have banded together to market Tempranillo from their region. So, so, you know, and, and there's a, a lot of time and effort that goes into these things. And as we're looking at the business plan template and how you're going to allocate your time and your efforts, uh, it really, it really gets to become quite the challenge to, to figuring out what you're going to do and how much focus you're going to have on which parts of your own business, let alone the larger marketing efforts that go into regions and, you know, grape styles and, or wine styles, grape types, that stuff. So, um, let's see, Greg and I had a really great conversation. Uh, Carol, you and I are due pretty soon. Um, and then, uh, there's Kelly. He was on and then he disappeared. Welcome back. Um, so any, any, uh, any questions about where we're at or the material that we started to cover last week? I really enjoyed that little cartoon video that, that you sent, um, the the uh, the woman who has the grapes and wants the distributor to sell yeah. her grapes. <laughs> I, was, I felt like I, like I was would be talking to myself in that scene. Yeah, I mean the the thing about that, and and if you go in, into YouTube, you can find uh, literally dozens of those uh, cartoons. There's a guy in Australia, and I've talked to a really great guy. He said, "Oh, thanks for sharing with your class, but." Uh, then there's another U.S. guy who's doing them, but they are they they really are like like they say telling it like it is. Mm -hmm. I mean, these are the things that go on. Uh, uh, Michael and I had a great discussion this week also about his business and looking yeah. at it and and all sorts of, of of how to use the wine biz sim to understand his suppliers better, and then also knowing what goes into from the point of purchase, once he's purchased wines in Italy, what are the costs on every step of the way to get them landed in his possession so that he can then mark them up and sell them and 
and how, how that works. And, and then also building a, a longer term strategy because uh, 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 you, you can say, shut up, Tim, if I, if I broach too far, but Michael's working right now building a business. He's got extraordinary expenses involved in getting the product here and, and trying to, to work, work that business up, build the relationships, go to tastings, do yeah. all the footwork. And it's, it's, it's not cheap. No, and part of the other issue here in Florida, at least, is you have a small window with the season, you know, from, you know, November to April. And after that, things get a little quiet. So don't have a lot of time to, to beat the bushes. Yeah. And, and then, you know, for Carol, and, and uh, uh, in the world of tasting rooms and, and winery traffic, uh, I'm going to guess right now you've been getting a lot of snow and tasting room visitations are pretty much pretty in much. the nosedive. Uh, actually, the last couple of weekends have been really good, but normally it's so quiet up there. So. Yeah. And is, has it been good because of the snow, actually? Is that brought... We don't get, you no, know, we're in the foothills, so we don't Okay, get, so you're down below all that, right? Yeah. But, it, yeah and are you on, on, on the way to a ski destination, or, or what, what, no, what brings? Kind of off 49, uh -huh. like down, down from Placerville, um, but people wouldn't necessarily go through there to get up to. <coughs> Got it. Yeah, so you're an out-of-the-way destination. Pretty much. Yeah, right. it's around Plymouth, and it's kind of its own little area on its own. But um, when we get to more questions, I'd love to ask you about social media um, for wineries and what what your take is on that whole end of marketing. Yeah, well, let's let's just dive right into it um, uh, because if you know you've you've really got a. a today you've you've really got to uh, have a grasp on what you are or are not going to do in social media who's doing it well um who is doing it well well you know i'll leave that up to the class uh, uh any anybody seen any social media campaigns or know of any people who are are doing a particularly great job of it <clears throat> yeah there is one that i'm very keen of, of. Um, it's our mutual friend, Steve Tamborelli, Claude Duval. Yep. So they set up a, a blog kind of a thing called Cab Vocates. C-A-B-O-V kits. Cab Vocates as advocates. Oh, got it. Cab Cab, cab Vocates. Cab Vocates. <clears throat> and so the marketing team. Uh, they make a kind of a contest out of it. So they have a points system for questions that they toss out and the points then accumulate towards goodies from Clos Duval. And they pose a variety of questions that helps them understand what makes them unique. Why do they, I mean, it sounds like very top of the mountain, simple questions, but they ask questions about the tasting room experience. They have questions about the wines. <clears throat> they ask about the overall experience. And while some of these questions may appear to be simple, it keeps them engaged with their customers routinely, which is all about building the brand identity in the direction shift that Tamborelli took with Claude Duval. So, about once a month, maybe twice a month at the most, uh, a cabvocate question will pop out. And the team is very responsive as well. So when you send your little particular blurb in, somebody responds back to you to maintain a level of engagement. And, and, and really be, be clear, everyone, that social media requires engagement otherwise it's not social media just yes. posting ads or 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 these kind of things are not social media and you're gonna, you have the, to have that engagement one That's of the rules of social media is if you're going to have the guts to put up content you better keep putting up content because once it starts to go stale you lose your audience well actually let me let me make a 
my, my clarification is that it's not just putting up content, but it's getting that engagement in the reciprocity of communication. Precisely. Yeah. Precisely. And, if, and if anybody wants to see the, the master of this and the guy who just blew the lid open, Gary Vaynerchuk, and it's Wine Library TV, he had, I don't know, 11 million followers and he's now a media company and and uh and and he's just this wonderful hyperactive kid from a family from belarus that was in springfield new new jersey and they had a store and he started doing social media and he really really uh, uh literally wrote the book on it so i would i would suggest reading some of gary's materials um so let me actually back up just a little bit because if you look at at the, the the kind of the stages or the the process of turning some someone into a customer uh social media can be also broken down into uh, uh specific strategies uh and tactics that can be applied because the first the first stage of engagement in marketing once you've defined a market all right and so social media is going to be to anybody on certain platforms so then you've got to start to think okay well now personify who those who who your target market potentially is men and women of certain age groups with certain incomes and certain interests and so on and so forth and so so then you say okay well if i'm going to use facebook what's that what's that audience like and any thoughts on the difference between facebook snapchat instagram etc i mean in terms of demographics or what do you yeah well it just and, and even more simply just who uses it oh I think older people are on Facebook. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and but I but I still engage with my son. He still uses it, but it's not his primary engagement, oh. right? So, so if you look at the market, and then look at the the sort of evolutionary process, I I don't know of a better term, but first you've got to attract shoppers. Okay. So that's kind of one stage of the marketing process is to de determine the market and then do the things that are going to generate people to put eyes on your on your site. And this also goes for your bricks and mortar tasting room, retail store or whatever, right? But you 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 need to to get people to become shoppers so that they're looking at stuff then the key is to convert a shopper into a customer. So that's, that's your conversion rate. And these are important metrics. So when you're also designing your social media uh, programs, you really want to find out how much detail you can get about web visits and how long people spend on your website and, and that kind of data. Uh, and then most importantly, how many of the people that come to your website actually make a purchase? And Carol, the same thing for, for the bricks and mortar tasting room. You get a lot of people that just come in, they shop. Can I interest you in a glass of wine? Oh, we're just looking. And if they walk out the door, you've not converted them into a customer. Mm -hmm. And then what? once you get them as a customer, the key is customer retention. How long will you have them as a member of the wine club, buying wine in the stores when they see your brand, those kind of things. And so what you're saying, Rich, really resonates because what Clodeval's done is they've created something for people, it sounds like, that have already been, for the most part, been converted. Correct. And they're gamifying it which means you do certain things, you, you accumulate certain points, you get certain rewards, you get invitations to certain events, uh, you get 
you accumulate so many points, maybe you get a discount or something like that. And, and it's this kind of engagement that's really become the imperative because you can keep doing your email blasts, but as soon as somebody starts hitting delete enough to go to hit unsubscribe, you've lost them. Well, and that was a key thing in one of the <clears throat> Valley Bank uh, things about both direct to customer, DTC branding and marketing, as well as the, um, the, the tasting room. And that the uh, average man member tenure in a, a wine club is about 30 months. That's the statistical average. Is 30 months? 30 months. That's the average that they found by way of their most recent survey. Okay. I, I want to, ch uh, let, that's got my curiosity peak because it's, uh, my understanding is more like three months. <laughs> no. <clears throat> um, For the average. Again, yeah. I'm, I'm not arguing. I, I, need to, I need to look at the data because what, there's, there's something called the churn rate. Did they discuss that, Rich? Yes, they did. And, and the, the churn rate is the number of people who sign up and then unsubscribe from the club. Yeah, they got into that. Now, <clears throat> in the report that they generate to the P, there's a report that, back up one, they generate a report from all the people that participated in the survey. And if I remember correctly, in the last survey that they did, which was the 2017 link that I sent, there were 1,200 wineries that participated, uh, largely from California and Oregon and Washington State. There were some participants from upstate New York and other parts of the country, but the greatest preponderance, 85, 90% were from the West Coast. Yeah, that, so get, get to the point on it. So. so the point of it was they talked about membership acquisition they talked about membership retention they they had a slide on the churn rate but they didn't get into that one slide because it didn't have enough time i'll do i'll do a little bit more looking around but my understanding that the churn rate is well over 40 percent a year and 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 that would mean that the average length of of wine club membership is really short. Now, what's important about the churn rate, that's the number, if you've got 100 wine club members and you have a churn rate of 40%, and maybe that's over even two years, you're adding new members, and but you've got to add equal to your churn rate just to break even the number of, of, of wine club memberships you're maintaining. And that's, and that's where people really, really get stuck. So you, if you had a churn rate of 40%, uh, you know, you've know you got 100 members, and out of that 40 drop off, that means you're adding 40 new members just, just to break even. So, so if, you, if you want growth, it's got to be over and above that churn rate. But the, the, key, the key part of uh, the strategy that they've embarked upon, as well as others that I am aware of, personally um there's a higher degree of sales dollar volume per retained customer than new customer and the profitability is higher in retaining those customers than uh simple spot buys in the taste room and so forth so they're putting as well as i said as well as others are putting a fair amount of effort into retention uh, not to say they're not trying to recruit new customers, but a high degree of emphasis is on retention. Right. Now, you were also saying they're trying to sell higher price products? <clears throat> or no? Yes. Yeah. Uh, generally, a higher price product. Uh, in their particular case, uh, they cut their production literally in half to go fully estate-grown uh, varietals. <clears throat> So uh, they're not trying to load the, uh, the three-tier channel, <coughs> excuse me, with product. Um, they're focused largely on their relationships with the better quality hotels that carry their brand, the restaurants that carry their product, uh, and direct-to-consumer and, and web sales. Got it. 
So one of the other things is you've got to really keep a look at uh, what's happening in in your relationship with your customers. Um, I was hoping Heather might be on the call tonight. Did everybody read her post? Of, she she did her homework. She gets an A plus on her homework. The Moscato. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I saw that. Yep. Hey, Greg, hey, Greg are you in the witness protection program? <laughs> uh, no. Uh, I, I was just going to uh, uh, weigh in and because I read the same report uh, just this week that the the average is about 30 months that people belong to a wine club. And I thought that that sounds pretty accurate. And I don't know if it was this Silicon Bank group that has all the webcasts, but they were talking about how to market to boomers and millennials. Right. And the one thing might have been the week before, but I heard the 30 month uh, comment and it really piqued my interest because, you know, I'm a I'm a boomer and then you get a. Uh, some data that 10,000 millennials are uh, replacing 10,000 boomers in a subscription economy. And I've never framed it like that. It's uh, then they look at what boomers and millennials are drinking and then they try to typify the demographic, meaning millennials, if you're going to market to them are frugal, but curious meaning they don't have a lot of money because they're having kids and buying houses and they don't have money to buy premium wine, but they're drinking. And how do you market to a, a millennial versus retired income boomers who, how do you get them to drink premium wines when they're on fixed incomes if they're not wealthy? So my mind is trying to wrap around all this data now that is coming to me that I didn't obviously no a month ago so i yeah. find it fascinating yeah it, and it is fascinating and and it's and, and it's the world of market segmentation mm -hmm. and and this this is um uh in in computing let me get to this actual section of the of the um hang on a second so i'm off the witness protection program now well, I don't see you. So no, you're still in the up. dark. Oh, I am. Yeah. I am. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there you go. Yeah, I thought it was because I was being quiet. No, you're like in the shadows. Oh. All right. Wait a minute. Where I've lost my my personification. Okay. So there's there's a. The process, uh, I worked with a, a, with one of my companies with a bunch of guys from Intel. And they were, they made a lot of money in Intel and, and were, one was an, an engineer who went into marketing and the other was an engineer that was in product development. But they both um, were familiar with something called personification and taught me about it. So we were designing an education program for Marriott, um, and it was certification and and all these things for for their their frontline staff, and also for management. And so the idea was, okay, they're gonna they're gonna uh, uh, have an online account in with our company, and then there are lessons. And then there are tests and they go through all these things and they get certified on beverage sales and beverage standards. It's their, the Marriott program is called the gold standard program. <clears throat> so, so the way, the way personification worked was instead of to say, Oh, let's take this world of millennials and you can never wrap your head around it because the millennials in Portland, are are hip hop? They're they got a look. They've got a, almost a dress code. They are way different than millennials in Miami. That are totally different from millennials in San Diego. That may be totally different from millennials in Chicago or Bend or wherever. Right. <clears throat> 
So what we did was we, we took what we knew our, our target uh, audience in this case, it wasn't per se a market, but it was Marriott servers. And you've got young people, you've got uh, retired people that, are, that just love people and love serving. You've got people who live in urban locations that work at huge hotels, and you've got some people in Peoria that work at a conference center near the Peoria airport, right? So we, we started a process to, to invent personas for as many people as we could. And we ended up with, with close to 50 personas, right? 50 personas. Sally lived in Peoria. She was uh, divorced, had two kids. This was her job to feed her family and so forth. This is her behavior. She didn't, didn't have a, a quality home computer and so on. So, so you really drill into this person's lifestyle. And the question was, where is Sally going to sit down at a computer and do the, do the program? And then everybody went, huh? Because Sally doesn't have access to a, a computer at work and she's supposed to get paid for this. So how are they supposed to log the amount of time that she's doing this and so on and so forth. The, the point of it is, is that you really get so much out of the practice of saying, okay, millennials can be going to college, they can be young families, they can be this, this, and this. Where are they shopping? Which social media is their primary, secondary, and tertiary? What, how did they grow up and what do they value about wine? And What's the competitive atmosphere for them, which is a lot more of, of craft cocktails and, and craft beers and pot and all these other things. And they don't have the values that somebody like me and probably more like Michael would have around, you know, the history and the tradition and the lore. And they don't want to feel like they've got to become educated to you. They want to look smart but they don't want to feel like they're being forced into an education. Does that make sense? Yeah. And then all of a sudden, or, so you do this and, and you look at what, what market am I going to with my product? And if it's my tasting room, and then this is what you need to be doing, Carol, is who walks through those doors and, it's, and, and how can you personify as, as, as broad a range as possible of people, why do they end up in your tasting room? How did you get them there? And if they're a millennial or a retiree or a vacationer or a local, do you have different ways to, to reach and market to them to keep that traffic, to get them to join the wine club and to keep them for as long as possible? And so personification is really the essence of of what everybody's trying to do with all this data that's out there. How do you, how do you put it together in a, a useful form? And, and correct me if I'm wrong, but that's what you're kind of looking at, right, Greg? There's. Yeah. And it's not that I've got to really zero in on a demographic because in a restaurant setting, you get all types and you don't want to ever stereotype someone which made me believe, well, maybe the Silicon Bank is uh, taking a demographic of millennials and maybe they're California millennials. What your, your comment about Peoria just made me think of that. And across the board, you just can't put a millennial in the category of frugal but curious. Right. They don't have a lot of money, but the comment was this group is brilliant in how they obtain information and buy hence maybe a subs what they do with their mobile phones would blow a baby boomer away for example in how they shop how they get their information and uh one of the comments was they're they're just brilliant at it so how do you market wine to that demographic yep and it's one demographic out of about four that you should have some 
comprehension of. But let me, let me help you break it down a little further though, Greg, because the, the problem is you're looking at such a, a huge amorphous conceptual thing called millennials. Mm -hmm. And uh, I own a couple of them. <laughs> yes. <laughs> And and so one of one of one part of my millennial family uh, uh, is a husband and wife power couple in San Diego who were uh, all about the bling. Uh, we're we're getting our first grandchild in July, yay! And um, uh, they're totally cash strapped, not because they don't earn a lot. It's just because they spend spend a lot. lot. Yeah. And that means that it, that whether it's a thousand dollar fishing rod or you know the 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 right color coordinated this or that or the car or whatever, they put a lot of emphasis on the bling factor and whatever they want the status and so forth. So so that's a millennial persona, if you will. They're they're totally into the paleo diet and. And, you know, so they've got all these, but, and they're representative of millions of millennials. Now, let me take my other millennial son. He's an engineering student at UC Davis. He and his girlfriend, literally, I swear to God, this is how they, they spend their time when they're not studying or, or, or doing activities. They are sitting side by side, or when they're at our house in Bend, they've got two laptops opened. And their phones are right next to them. They're poor as dirt. They're both living through the parents and, and, and trying to do that kind of stuff. And they're, they're gaming, eating, drinking, and communicating to each other. They're sitting there face to face, but they're mess. They're texting each other at the same table. <laughs> <clears throat> So, 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 so your instincts are right, Greg. If they're saying millennials are this, which millennials? Because you, you, you need to further segment those millennials down, and that's where the personification, okay, there's, there's millennial seeking status, and how do they do that? What are their social behaviors? And if you gamified something, what would make it a status symbol to them? Right. Tim, I would even challenge if the six of us could agree on what is the age of millennials. I think there's a formal definition. Because we've had that discussion with some friends and no one can seem to agree. All right. There you go. A person reaching young adulthood in the 21st century. So I think it's it's considered mostly uh, people born between uh, roughly 1980 and 1990. Does, how does that fit with, with you guys? Yeah, look, look, right. right on Wikipedia. It's got yeah. some numbers. Yep, okay, yeah. Yep. And but, they outnumber boomers, right? Yes. But the, but the point is, there's many of them. They're not all just one thing. And you've got to really carefully look at the source of information also. This one stood out because, uh, let's see here. What happened to my, oh. Um, so, so Dustin put this up, and this is a great, a, a great thing to put up. Because what's the source of this? Millennials are drinking so much wine, they're changing how it's sold. They do that with everything, though. Everything is being changed by millennials. They're killing this industry and this and that. I think it's BS. I well, challenge, uh, Tim, I challenge the, the topic there. Because just absolutely. last week, they're not spending much money on it. No, no. This is great. Who wrote this? <laughs> right. Anybody know? A millennial. No, it was written by tastingroom.com. Oh. So, it, so, so again, the, here's a strategy. They're trying to use provocative things like this to get you to become a shopper. Hmm. Like, 
like misleading yeah like her hyperbole hyperbole and 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 whatever would we that don't be know that in fact but the liquor store doesn't always give us the best this was fed to whatever this is is this market fertilizer yeah it is absolutely is, yes. isn't that what great marketing is just a bunch of fertilizer well i'll give you a share of personal experience um the wine blending exercise right yeah. So I, I hosted my son, who's 30, and his girlfriend the last half a year or so, she's 25, maybe 26. Um, we had a lot of fun, but both of them uh, are pretty successful for their age, uh, both college degrees, professional jobs, uh, and they pay exorbitant rents to live in San Francisco. So um, as many boomers that are in this part of the country, meaning the greater San Francisco Bay Area and similar metropolitan areas, the greatest percentage of their income goes to housing and living expenses. Right. So and long and short, Rich, we gotta gotta do so, these quickly, so, get to the so, point. Get so to the point. to the point about the millennials and where they spend their money. Their average purchase price for a bottle of wine is between 10 and 15 bucks max. Got it. So, so get that, that I think it's over 70% of the wine sold in the United States is $10 or less. All right. Now get also, I want every one of you to stop saying, oh, the millennials. <laughs> because because it, it's doing such an injustice to any plausibility of marketing to groups of millennials defined by by geographic space by uh by virtual space by disposable income by focus and values uh my my uc davis millennial couple kids uh really value dumpster diving seriously and and the other ones like Mr. Bling. So you can't, you just, you, you'll never get anywhere if you, if you think that millennials are just one unit. They're not. It's, it's broken down into millions of individual units. So how can you then create a strategy? And again, you know, uh, this is one idea. Now, the other thing that I want to segue into, does, does this make sense about how to break down and, and, and learn how to 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 um, to create t target markets so that you're not looking at so huge a group that you could never actually get any useful data whatsoever like millennials does that make sense yeah i think it's uh your your position in the market whether you're tasting room uh in the business hotel retail restaurant my observation is there's not hardly any difference between a millennial and a baby boomer when they're at a dining room table and they're eating food and drinking wine. Oh, well, I, I would argue that, that two baby boomers could be so, so po polar different in what they're doing. And that's, that's the crux of what I'm trying to point out. So the, it, it, there are, are millennials that have behaviors like baby boomers or beyond there are millennials who have totally new different behaviors there's baby boomers in portland that have lots of disposable income and high-tech jobs and there are baby boomers in portland who are just scraping by and students or 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 just working as a server in the restaurants and so forth so so again try to articulate and define the market much better than saying millennials. I, so I think I've beaten that horse to death. Now here's the other thing that I wanna talk about, and that is what, what do people really want? How, do, how well is, is the wine industry prepared to engage with the market? Okay, and Heather, uh, you're not with us here today, but thank you so much for doing this homework. So she went into the tasting room and uh, 
said that she liked Moscato, and she, and she does, by the way, love Moscato. And she was snubbed. She was cut out of the herd. She doesn't count. It's despicable. Yeah, and it's what we do with wine education. It's what we do with wine and food pairing. But it's also what we do when we try to define the market. All right. I'm just glad to finally get an answer why people keep saying that the wine wine is unapproachable. That we need to make wine more approachable. It's because this is still because going. We, we train the industry to be inhospitable. So here's a process and it has to do, I may have mentioned before my role with Moscato and making it what it is today, but let me give you some details. In 2007, I was doing some work for Sutter Home. Uh, I had been, of course, my background was with Behringer and one of the senior marketing people from Behringer ended up at Sutter Home and then brought me into a marketing, what was called an ideation meeting. Ideation is the process of coming up with ideas, right? And so in, in product development, the ideation could be, wow, I tried this really great burgundy, I'm gonna try and replicate it here in, in, in Willamette Valley, or wow, I was having dinner in this New Mexico restaurant and I love hot, spicy chilies and I thought wonder how wine would be with hot spicy chilies I'm actually going to be at a winery that does that in New Mexico in, in next month um, so ideation is coming up with the ideas so they wanted to know according to research that I do in in consumers behaviors and attitudes and preferences what's going to be the next best the next big thing and this is in 2007 and I just flatly said, the next big thing is Moscato. And they, they said, why? And I said, because my mother-in-law, when she goes out, won't drink white Zinfandel because we've been so excess, successful at making her feel embarrassed for what she likes. And, and it's her favorite wine. She's a PhD in economics. She's a millionaire. She, she was recruited for fast pitch professional softball leagues, and she was a semi-pro golfer. But in the eyes of the wine industry, she's uneducated, unsophisticated, uh, probably can't afford any better trailer trash, basically. Hmm. They said, why Moscato? And I said, because when I give her Moscato, she goes, wow, I love this. <laughs> they said, well, so, so we should do this whole campaign based on this? I said, no, do, do the product development, do the, the proper things, but Moscato is pronounceable, it's Italian, it doesn't have any baggage associated with it, and the people who like White Zinfandel, who we were finally pushing to craft beer into cocktails, and, and White Zin was just beginning to decline, love it. So. I actually helped them to formulate the blend and their winemakers could not create the blend. I actually had to go in and say, this is it because they wanted to make it drier. They wanted to make it oak age. They wanted to give it more acidity, more complexity. I said, no, it needs to be delicious for this intended market. That's all. And it needs to be more expensive. So they were making 125,000 cases of 399 Moscato. It was the largest selling Moscato in the world at the time. They repositioned it. They raised the price. They added a little bit more residual sugar. And in seven years, it was selling at three and a half million cases. It almost doubled the average selling price. And I don't care whether you're making a Willamette Pinot Noir, a, a, a Napa a cult wine, whether it's this fabulous Italian estate, uh, whether it's a, a chili winery in New Mexico or a Traminette, a uh, great variety that's being grown in Michigan or Wisconsin, you really need to articulate the market for which the product is intended be able to create the messaging 
to create that attraction that gets people to become shoppers, that, that become interested in the product. And then you've got to have whatever inducement, whatever value proposition in the taste of the product or in giving away free shipping or having a you know gamified things to do or whatever. If they don't turn into a customer, you go out of business, right? So Tim, taking that thought to the modern time frame. Yes. One of the big areas for growth in the marketing side of the business are various forms of marketing automation. One of the biggest packages is VIN 65. Yes. Right, that's one of them. Another, another one that I've come across. There's a, just, uh, there's a bunch of them, so just go ahead, yeah. So when it comes down to VIN 65, Active Club Solutions and so forth, what are you seeing as far as that becoming more and more integrated into the overall marketing competence of the wineries? Well, it, it, it becomes, let me go back up. What do you envision yourself, your company doing? What are your strengths and weaknesses? What are the opportunities and threats, et cetera, right? So what VIN 65 and, and, and what this, these, and, and the many companies like this, what they've done is they, they've, they've looked at pain points of the industry, and especially for the wine, smaller wineries, they can get a cousin maybe to make their website, or maybe they hack something out or this or that, but, yeah. but, but they may lack the expertise or the money, right? These would be two weaknesses. I don't have the money and I don't have the expertise to sink into a web manager or to pay somebody to set up uh, my shopping cart and my portal and to do all this and that. And then, oh my God, now, now we're getting orders and, and Carol will verify when, when, it, when it's wine club shipment day, it's, it's a nightmare. You know, you've got boxes everywhere and you're trying to pack things and, and, uh, and to deal with the logistics and whatever. Is that what you need to be doing? Because your bottling line is breaking down and, You've got a problem in the vineyards and you've got people in your tasting room. So it's a matter of weighing the options. And uh, what you're referring to, uh, Rich, is biz a business that was created about solving problems and offloading and outsourcing. Your, they give you a web template. They give you the, all the online uh, transactional uh, uh, things that you need. And they even take care of fulfillment. You send wine in to their source. So when an order comes in or when you're preparing your wine club order, it goes out. It costs more, maybe, <laughs> maybe not. But it's, it's one of the options that's available for how you're going to spend your time and, and effort and your money. You can also invest in VIN 65 and get that implemented in your tasting room find out that they don't make the web products very um, user-friendly and right. you can't change things to do certain blah, blah, blah. You end up scrapping the whole thing after spending all that money because you realize it doesn't actually work for you. Yeah, and, and that's the other thing. You've got to do the due diligence for any of this to call up a t another tasting room and say, hey, what, it, do you have any experience with this? Or you know, how does it work for you? And different wineries with different, you know, scale and uh and priorities have different things it, and i was actually uh going to show here hang on a second so this is this is what's going on at the the oregon uh, uh wine symposium is all of these companies that do everything from flooring to metal fabrication to containers to corks to biomaterials to the different uh, companies that help with websites and fulfillment, uh, companies like Constant Contact, you know, the customer relationship management tools, all those kind of things are all here. And look at the list of banks, package, creative packaging supplies, nurseries, chillers, um, let's see, attorneys. <laughs> 
What's a comparable, is there a comparable conference like that down here? Uh, yes, yeah, well, actually the biggest, the biggest in the world is a Unified Grape Symposium. It just happened in Sacramento. Yep. Oh, okay. It was a lot of fun. I, I, you, they can move you through because instead of staying there talking, you can just hold out your badge, they scan it, and they'll send you stuff later. Yep. You can just keep walking. Yeah, and, and, and it's, it's just great to go in and, and, and ideate, <laughs> right? Uh, I'll be speaking um, uh, at, at the end of this month, I'll be in uh, uh, Kalamazoo, Michigan at the, at the Michigan version of this, Michigan Grow, Wine Growers Association. Tim, and, can you scroll down a little bit more? Sure. I just want to see, keep going. I just want to see who else there. And, and just you can just uh, Google Oregon Wine Symposium and it'll come up labeling companies, construct construction, cross flow filtration, orchard, vineyard people. Um, yeah, and actually, I just wanted to point out Vin 65 is now called Wine Direct. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. And there they are, form the formerly known as. Right. Right. And we're, they can rebrand it. We're still getting rid of them. Yeah. Yeah, and, and again, you know, and they they work great for some people. I know some people who have used them and love it. But Kelly, what were your issues? Um, mostly changing the prices on discounts. Uh, so they worked with the the engineers. Um, they couldn't get certain discounts to uh, to work to populate and to populate. That's the gist of it. Yeah. Plus, plus they're not a tech company; they're an e fulfillment company. So. Moving around the templates and whatnot was proved very difficult. So who did you like you said, Who have you that? moved to? I don't remember the name of it. It starts with an R. I haven't started. I haven't implemented it yet. Let's see if they're in the R's. Yeah, we were talking about barrel barrel uh, uh, options and in chips and whatever. But there's also inner staves, scrape barrels, all kinds of stuff. So here's here's one of those companies. Um, then there's also the ship compliant. I think this is a, uh, uh, a compliance uh, service provider. Uh, the, the, the thing to know is that it, the marketing goes way, way, way beyond the consumer. The need at the consumer level is, is, to, is, is, uh, is, is to articulate, to create segments that then give you the ability to say, okay, if we're doing social media, if you're looking at social media, Carol, you really need to find out which platforms, where do you spend the most time and attention, where do you spend the ad dollars, et cetera, et cetera. And then what's the kind of content for those people? Do they want bucolic pictures of vineyards in our cool coastal or in the foothills and blah, blah, blah? Or do they want something wacky and crazy like uh, 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 the prisoners talking on the labels, you know, with the smartphone thing? And at the end of the day, did that ever sell any wine or not? Who knows, right? <laughs> like the, the cookie pairing, I found out it didn't do, it was total BS. No one cared oh, yeah. about the cookie wine pairing. Well, wine and food pairings total BS. So I'll just throw out that little tidbit. <laughs> Every bit of it. <laughs> hey, I like my cheeseburger in a cab. There you go. Absolutely. And there's uh, I'm, I'm preaching that the the that Tim. I'm 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 putting that out there to everybody. Not only is it the that the, the, the sweet wine drinkers have um, more taste receptors and they're actually better tasters, but uh, I'm also preaching that to you know drink what you like. Well, actually, let me give you a, I'm, we're going to end on this critical clarification. They're not better tasters. Actually, having more taste buds and having higher taste sensitivity leads them to want to have rescue pets. They're empathetic because they're picked on. They were picky eaters. They've been punished their entire life for the sensory world they live in. So, so we always try. Our brains are conditioned to think in mm -hmm. metaphorically better or best or worse or this. There are people who live in a certain sensory world that experience things in a way that dry wines will never be good.
they will never enjoy them. And, and, and it's not a matter of education or sophistication or anything else. It's who they are genetically and biologically. There are others that live in a world that can't understand how you can like that sweet crap, but they're not experiencing the bitterness and the astringency and the horrible characteristics those people are. And so, so the, the people who love sweet wines are the worst people to be critics or to be judges of wines for the people who live at the other extreme. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's a good way to frame it. And, and yes, it's predominantly women, but it's importantly 30% men who feel mm. totally out of place with a pink or a sweet wine or whatever. Again, because of metaphorical and, and, and how mm. we've done this. Well, that, makes, that makes sense now why that guy wanted his cab with a can of Coke. Yeah. And he mixed them. And, and guess where that's the, the, the rage. Guess what, what region in the world is Coca-Cola and red wine a thing? China. Uh, was that, huh? Where? China. Brazil? No. Wasn't it South America somewhere? Nope. It's the Basque country of Spain and France. It's oh. called a Calamocho. They've got a statue made. So look it up. K-A- L I X or K A L I M O X O or something like that. Calamocho. I heard that seven years ago and I, I couldn't remember it. And it's the mystery solved. Thank you. There you go. That's why you take this class, right? <laughs> it's, it's Coke and red wine? Yeah. And, yeah. and and it's saving the wine industry. It is the thing in uh, in France and Spain. So here you go. One part red wine, one part cola or other soft drink. Mm. And, and it's what, what they're drinking in Spain and France, not China. I've, 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 I've seen it, the soda on the table, but I've never won. And I've been going to China sometimes five times a year for 30 years. And I've never seen anybody mix the, but I've, I've actually told people it's quite okay to do it because you're actually, this is an honored tradition in France and Spain. If the wine tastes like crap, make it taste better. <laughs> Sounds like a wine cooler. It is. Sounds like wine coolers, I mean, what's the national drink of Spain? Anybody know? Coke. What's the national drink of Spain? Oh, um. It starts with an S and ends in Angria. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's not Rioja, it's not Tempranillo or Nacha. It's freaking wine that's been mixed with fruit juice and it's delicious and it's served with lamb or it's with fish and all throughout Spain. We we've over we, we've gone too far with our marketing and we've gone too far with who we think the market is. And it and it hurts this industry every day. It costs us billions of dollars. But we'll get into that later. Cool. So, uh, anybody uh, that gets a chance to go up to Pride Vineyards in Sonoma with their fabulous estate Cabernets and Merlot and blends, they're now offering uh, raspberry syrup in their Viognier for anybody who loves sweet wine. At Pride? Yeah. I gotta check them out. I was up there. I was up by those guys um, last June. Go up and say hi to Tim. I, 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 uh, I've got a long history with, with the Pride and, and, and uh, even longer, actually, with Claude Duvall and the owners, uh, uh, the, the founder, uh, Bernard Porte. Porte Go yeah. up to Pride and ask for Tim. You'll be able to – and Tim Boucher is their, uh, manages their wine club and everything else. I just got, got, got back from doing a workshop for them for a, an entire morning and as a result of it they're they're going to start honoring sweet wine lovers and honor the tradition of the kir and if if they recognize that anybody loves sweet wines they'll say we love you too by the way did you know i have the most taste buds buy a bottle of our viognier and also a bottle of this raspberry syrup try them together isn't that awesome and tell everybody else to shut up and get off your back and they just made two <laughs> They just, they just earned a customer for life. They earned a customer for life. How do you do that? 
That's that's what marketing is. A customer and, for life. Plus it's fun. Uh, you know, I have a drink that I like. It's champagne and Guinness beer. Yeah. It's called the black velvet and it tastes a lot like Coke. It's yep. it's fun. It's delicious. It is. Yeah. And the French had the Kier and and so on wow. and so forth. We've we we we've, we've gotten a little too full of ourselves. Uh we're going to start to pick it up next week and then in two weeks, I'll give you the the, the full hand eye that I'm gonna. Yeah, another one yeah. is uh, is a uh, decent quality white sparkling wine in Chambord. Yeah, uh, yeah. that's the, the, Kier, the Kier Royale and ad nauseum. Okay, guys. This, this Cal Emotion, this is like a hangover in motion, man. With the alcohol and the sugar. <laughs> it, it it it's it's how wine is being consumed in France and Spain in areas that are known for wine. All right. Wow. So so give up your give up your opinions and look at the market newly. Look at consumers in a different light. Talk to people engage do what heather did go out as a white zin drinker especially in a go to a ruth chris or a morton's or something and say hi i'd love a glass of white zinfandel and and see what our wine industry is training people to do to you yeah, tim i, I kind of like where we're finishing because i talked to about 30 people every night and my message for years has been drink what you like and forget about the rules. The problem is that when they go out to a restaurant, that's not what's what they're they're greeted with. So I agree with that. How do we how do we do something different so that that they'll actually feel confident doing that? It's a starting point and it's a fun conversation. Yes, it is. And and there's something that the entire industry could do, and that's my mission. If you look at my vision, mission, and goals, I'll share that with you at the end of the class. All right. Thank you. <laughs> okay, everybody. Hope you had fun. This is this is a good good group. Thanks. Yes. Yep. Tim. See you Wednesday. See you guys.